Welcome to the Meaningful Work Matters podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Soren, founder of Eudaimonic by Design. On this podcast, we'll dive into the world of meaningful work, explore its complexities, and examine its impact on people and the organizations they're a part of. Each episode features insightful conversations with cutting-edge experts who are successfully navigating the challenges of meaningful work. We hope to offer you ideas, frameworks, and tools to unlock potential and design work that's fulfilling, impactful, and supports everyone's well-being. Subscribe or follow us now, and let's make meaningful work matter. On today's episode, you're going to meet Dr. David Bluestein, a distinguished scholar and professor and Golden Eagle faculty fellow at Boston College in the Lynch School of Education and Human Development. David has spent decades working on the psychology of working. This is a framework that's reshaped our comprehension of careers, professional lives, and the nuanced relationship between meaningful and decent work. Welcome, David. It is a pleasure to be able to have you with us on this Meaningful Work Matters podcast. Maybe you can just start by introducing yourself and talking a little bit about your relationship to meaningful work. Okay, thank you, Andrew. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm a, a professor and Golden Eagle faculty fellow at Boston College in the Lynch School of Education and Human Development. And uh, I've been studying psychology of working, which is a main kind of uh, impetus that I've had over the years for a number of decades. And actually, I would say I, I've spent most of my adult life thinking about work, uh, working, um, honoring people who work, uh, and particularly focusing on people on the margins in the workplace. That has been my main interest. Uh, people who've been left out, who are invisible, um, who, who don't have necessarily meaningful jobs, meaningful careers. So in relation to meaningfulness of work, I will first respond personally that I have felt incredibly fortunate to have a career that I really love, that I have felt a lot of challenge from and have derived a great deal of meaning from. I have both, I feel like it's both significant and it it makes me feel good. I mean, it's it gives me some positive sense of well-being. Um, at the same time, my interest in meaningful work is really kind of derived from the fact that in the family where I grew up and among the, my peers, my parents' peers, uh, there were many people who struggled uh, to get a foothold in the world of work. And I saw people, you know, struggle with, with this sense of meaning. Why am I doing all of this? I mean, the main reason why people work, at least across the globe, in terms of the majority population of the world, is to, is to survive. And often they can derive meaning from survival, but very often the actual tasks of work do not add much to their sense of meaning. I love the work that you've done on the psychology of working. I think that it's profound. I think that it's systemic. It, it reveals the complexity of what working means in our life. And so maybe, um, maybe you can just start by helping those who are listening understand even what you mean by the psychology of working. Sure. So the the tradition I come from is is the career development and vocational psychology field, where we have been doing research theory development in many ways to inform uh, our understanding of how people develop, implement, and adjust to careers across the lifespan. So I had been doing work in that space probably for the first 15 years of my post-PhD life. Prior to that, I worked as a master's level counselor. Um, with a particularly important job at a community college outside of New York City. So the um, interest in psychology of working emerged for me in the late 90s, mid to late 90s, as I began to think more critically about the field of career development. And I realized that most of the prevailing theories and assumptions of the late 20th century really focused on people with some degree of privilege, some degree of access to, to work, some sense of volition in their work lives. And I felt like I needed to focus on people who uh, engaged in work, uh, which is a broader term that encompasses career, but it also includes people whose work lives um, are not considered by them or maybe by others to be hierarchical volitional careers. Typically in the world of career development, and you know, if you if you hearken back to the work of Donald Super, one of our most important theorists of the mid to late 20th century, 
uh, the idea of career was a sequence of jobs that were kind of related um, that people would have across the lifespan that often would um, provide increasing levels of responsibility or challenge or achievement. So it was really based on this kind of mythology of upward mobility. And that was the zeitgeist post-World War II in at least parts of the U.S., parts of other Western countries. That zeitgeist changed a lot in the 70s and 80s as the economy con contracted. So career was part of that um, that idea. Some, my, my friend and colleague, Mark Sificus, calls it a, uh, the grand career narrative. So that's what I mean by a career. And the volitional part of it is people having some choice about what they do. So you were saying that um, that this that that in some ways um, the psychology of working was a bit of a critique around that it kind of volitional a, careerist yeah. ladder. Yeah, it started as a critique of the careerist ladder, and I also felt like we needed a new paradigm, a new conceptual framework, and, and ultimately new theories. So, um, starting in two thousand one, I wrote an article in the Journal of Vocational Behavior kind of foreshadowing the psychology of working. And in 2006, I published my first book called The Psychology of Working, which um, after a few years started to make an impact. People started to read it, people started to cite it. Um, and the, I mean, it's an interesting point. I just had a, did a presentation over the summer um, in relation to my, my lifetime career. It was a kind of moving presentation to prepare. Mm -hmm. And I revealed that I, the term psychology of working actually came from um, my admiration of the work of Donald Super, who wrote a book in the 1950s called The, the Psychology of Careers, and also of my admiration for another important theorist of that era, Anne Rowe, uh, probably the first major female vocational psychologist who was often overlooked, sadly, uh, Anne Rowe wrote a book in 1956 called The Psychology of Occupations. So there was a, maybe a little bit of aspiration in me writing The Psychology of Working, but it, the focus is on working more broadly. Mm -hmm. So let's start with that critique. There's another part that I'd like to talk about eventually too, which is the values and morality part of, of this work. But let's start with the critique. If, if you're thinking about gender or race or culture or sexuality or disability or age, um, or even thinking about what work actually means, whether caring for somebody is work. Tell us a little bit about how psychology of working enters into that critique or, or what it's challenging. Um, first of all, it's challenging the notion that work um, exists either primarily or exclusively in the marketplace. So we believe that working does exist in caregiving contexts. Uh, caregiving is not always work, but it does encompass a lot of elements of work. Um, so the, the critique is on the kind of marketplace focus, the focus on um, people who have some degree of what I call career choice privilege. So um, it's a critique of that discourse it's not trying to kind of erase it or cancel it. It's trying to expand it and to understand the work lives of everybody who works and everybody who wants to work. Mm -hmm. I believe that there's space for a career development field within the world of psychology of working. It's, it's a broader, more inclusive perspective. Out of that, I developed a framework that focuses on the needs that working can fulfill and focuses on a number of other assumptions, the interface between work and relationships, the interface between work and mental health, um, the ways in which systemic factors, structural factors um, really frame the work lives for many people. The psychology of working framework um, was really about developing a new perspective and uh, uh, policy recommendations, as well as new intervention modalities, it, primarily in the area of counseling, but also more broadly in organizations and organizational development. So um, the 2006 book was a pretty detailed book and really outlined all of this. I was also very invested and still am in learning from the lived experience of people who are who are working, kind of hearkening back to Studs Terkel's famous book called Working, which incidentally has been reprised by Barack Obama and Michelle Obama in an amazing Netflix documentary, which I strongly recommend to listeners. I was, I was just, I just watched it about a week ago and I completely agree that it is, uh, it is well worth watching for anybody who is watching. There's, 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 there's pieces of it that, uh, 
that I would love to be able to critique in different ways and uh, and ask questions about in terms of what the role of a president is and asking these kinds of questions and and not necessarily having answers, uh, which is yeah. which is certainly the challenge. But um, but yes, I was very much reflecting on your work as I was as I was watching this documentary because I feel like it does a great job of being able to bring so much of that complexity to life. Yeah, yeah, I think it does as well. And in the earlier work, and we still do, we really focus a lot on the kind of systemic changes that need to be made, which will provide access to decent work and to meaningful work optimally. So let's let's talk about those two words um, and uh, and try to unpack what they mean. So I believe that when you talk about decent work, you're really leaning into the UN's International Labor Associations, um, the the uh, International Labor Organization's definition of decent work. Can you can you unpack what that means a little bit? Yes, I actually am definitely leaning into that uh, perspective. Um, the I'm, I'm very much influenced by the, the ILO, the International Labor Organization's work on the decent work agenda. So the ILO actually preceded the development of the UN. It started in 1919, right after World War I, with the premise being that if people had access to work that met some of their baseline needs, that maybe um, the predilection toward engaging in intense wars would be somewhat reduced. It's a very noble aspiration, and I'm sure there's some degree of truth to it. So out of that group, the ILO, which is housed in Geneva, um, they, uh, they affiliated with the UN. In 1999, they developed the Decent Work Agenda, which was a response to globalization and to, um, to really the neoliberal movement, which was, you know, people in the in the 1980s kind of having this belief that the marketplace could cure a lot of our ills and could reduce inequality these were the ideas particularly of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan and also by globalization and a lot of this was based on subcontracting out manufacturing work to countries where the um, labor costs were a lot lower now that has a great advantage to many countries who desperately needed this investment uh, but it also led to lower wages for workers and to the rise of what we call precarious work. So the ILO's response was to develop um, a policy, a set of policy guidelines called the Decent Work Agenda. And the main focus of the Decent Work Agenda is on meeting um, a specific set of needs that, that, would, that would provide the basic fundamentals of what people need to manage their lives. Um, and I will, so the, the needs include things like adequate compensation, access to adequate health care, um, hours that allow for free time and adequate rest, um, physically and interpersonally safe working conditions. Um, and also, and here's the part that dovetails with meaningful work, organizational values that complement family and social values. So that's the basic, um, the basic you know, infrastructure, if you will, of the decent work agenda. So we've used that in the psychology of working theory, which was developed in 2016 as the centerpiece for our model. And we developed a theoretical model where we foreground the macro level factors of economic constraints and marginalization. And uh, we present two potential mediating factors of work volition and career adaptability that would be influenced by these macro level factors. And then the centerpiece is having access to decent work. And here's where the meaningful work piece comes in. So access to decent work ultimately would hopefully lead people to be being able to meet some of the fundamental needs that working can fulfill, which we define as um, having three clusters. The first one is the need for survival and power. The second is the need for social connection and social contribution. And the third is the need for self-determination. Um, and readers can explore more of this if they like um, in some of my work. Um, and then optimally, if we get a lot of these needs fulfilled, we would have an opportunity to get some of the goodies in life, which would be uh, well-being and work fulfillment. Uh, it sounds a lot. It sounds very humanist in in yeah. some ways in its foundation. Certainly building on on folks like Maslow, or as it's been adapted into 
into the organizational literature. I guess someone like Hertzberg thinking about like the two factors that um, that we have these hygiene factors and motivational factors at work. Um, there's a, um, a, a psychologist whose name is Scott Barry Kaufman who just re um, re rewrote or re looked at uh, at Maslow's work and and kind of reimagined his pyramid. Um, uh, as a much more accurate way of thinking about it is probably a boat where where those those foundational needs um, are are kind of the vessel that we're just sit that are allowing us to sit upon the water, but they're not going to take you anywhere. It's in some ways the meaningful aspects that you're describing that are the wind and the sail that allow you to actually go somewhere. But if you just have a sail without the actual boat, you're going to sink. There's there's nothing that actually keeps you on the water. That's a wonderful metaphor. Yeah, that's really powerful. Yeah, Scott Barry Kaufman, you're our hero. Oh, um, so, so keep keep um, keep helping us understand a little bit about this relationship between between decent work and meaningful work, and what its implications are. Yeah. So, um, along with my uh, two co-authors and colleagues and friends, Ryan Duffy and Evgeny Lisova, we uh, just completed an article uh, for the annual review of organizational development and organizational psychology. Uh, and the title is Understanding Decent Work and, uh, and Understanding Meaningful Understanding Decent Work and Meaningful Work. It's a brilliant article for those who who uh, who are interested in this work. It's also uh, freely available for access to anybody um, who wants to search for it. Well worth well worth the read. So the um, basic idea that we propose in this article is that decent work is best understood as an antecedent to meaningful work. In order to have meaningful work. It would be better if you had access to decent work. If you if you had a job that met some of those fundamental needs, base we call them baseline needs. And we also propose that the psychology of working needs taxonomy, those three clusters of needs, survival, um, survival and power, and social contribution, connection, and self determination, would act uh, as a way of mediating the relationship between decent work and meaningful work. So. Um, so we basically developed this particular model so that we could understand the relationship between these two aspects of work. We, we believe that there are really two important elements and that it does have a lot of implications for, you know, listeners who might be organizational consultants or who might be involved in at the policy level, um, which is that in order to kind of establish workplaces where meaningful work is fostered, it would be good to make sure people's fundamental needs are met. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I love about the, this um, this article is actually a two by two that you have in the article that shows the relationship between meaningful work and decent work, and potentially uh, extrapolating from that some of the implications that that might have for research or practice or policy. Um, and so, um, and, and one of the reasons I like it so much, and in fact, one of the thing, one of the things that you do in this article that I think is so powerful is is do some some very significant storytelling. You 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 bring examples and cases of what it might look like to have high meaning and low decency, um, or or high decency and low meaning, uh, which are not necessarily always things that we think about. So so can you help us understand? And give us some some illustrations from from the two by two. Yeah, the two by two table um, has meaningful work at the top and low meaningful work and high meaningful work. You know, those are the two dimensions. And on the left side is decent work, low decent work, and high decent work. And we um, we try to describe what people's work lives might be like across these four different dimensions. So um, we we. We suggest that people who have high levels of decent work but low levels of meaningful work might find that they're basically doing non-significant work, but uh, they have satisfactory work conditions. And we could think about people like consultants uh, who work in safe and pleasant uh, environments but don't have a lot of stability in their lives. Um, thinking about people who are high in both decent work and meaningful work, these are folks who are doing meaningful work in very satisfactory work conditions. We could think about people who are who have like the job of their dreams or the job that comes close to the job of their dreams, where they're you know they have a lot of the fundamentals met, but also um, might be doing things that they find very meaningful, that they have, they attach a lot of significance to, they feel recognized, and that they also have positive feelings about. Uh, folks who are low in both decent and meaningful work are people who were doing non-significant work in what we would call exploitive work conditions. 
Um, and these, you think about people, for example, who would get attendants at a gas station. Um, they might be working with poorly organized shifts. They might not be able to have a predictable schedule. Um, and they might be working with difficult customers. Uh, we could think about a lot of people in the service sector um, who work in manual labor. Think about people across the globe in informal work contexts where they're really sweating it out each day. Are they going to have enough um, income? or goods from bartering to survive. And then we have folks who have high meaningful work, but low decent work. Um, and we could think here about um, or, or like musicians, for example. I often think about this example of, you know, I love music and we have so many great musicians, so many great artists. And think about all the people who were almost as talented as, you know, Bruce Springsteen or uh, Taylor Swift. Um, people, Ariana Grande, people who got who are close to that level, but didn't quite get a lucky break. And a lot of them stay in the field. And I actually sometimes I follow some of these artists who they've CDs out and I like them. But I, I often could tell that they might be struggling. They're playing in smaller venues and, um, you know, to half fill uh, audiences. So I think that's an example people who who have meaningful work, but it doesn't give them decent work conditions. I think it's extremely useful because it really helps us understand that if we're going to look at something like, hey, how do we build meaning at work? We can't just think about it as a one-size-fits-all solution. We're going to use the same intervention no matter where you go. So at the, you know, and I think that, um, that, that again, another key Another key to the psychology of working framework is the recognition that that has implication at a public policy level. It has an implication at an organizational level. How are you designing your organization? What are the what are the structural practices or policies that you're doing? As well as an, an, an individual level, you know, how are you helping an individual potentially find meaning at work? Well, very depending very, very just tremendously depending on whether they're in the job of their dreams um, or whether they're, you know, the the gas station attendant who has zero control uh, or autonomy of, um, of of almost anything that's um, that's part of their of their work and they're just trying to scrape by. So um, so I think it's extremely helpful to be able to to help us pull those pieces apart. I don't take all the credit for it. Uh, Ryan Duffy, who's been my close colleague and collaborator, uh, former student actually, when he was an undergraduate at Boston College, has done an amazing job. He was the lead on developing this theoretical model in 2016. And he and his former students are part of a community of, um, of scholars. And the, the, this community is expanding of people working in the psychology of working space. Mm -hmm. I wanna give a shout out as well to Blake Allen, and Kelsey Autan. These are also really close collaborators. Um, and, and in many ways, they represent the next generation of PWT scholars. Well, talking about next generation, what do you think any of the implications of this are for the future of work? Um, of psychology of working? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think one of the things that we have been successful in is pushing a more social justice inclusive agenda into the fields of uh, IO psychology, organizational psychology, work psychology, as they call it in Europe, and counseling and vocational psychology. And uh, for example, I've seen the increased use of the term work as well as career in my own discipline of, of vocational psychology. And I feel like that comes in part from this work. There's also been other people who've been advocating for a work-based discourse like Mary Sue Richardson and a, a group of other folks who've been writing in this in this space. Um, so I think this, there's a greater focus on inclusiveness, there's a greater focus on marginalization, on intersectionality, uh, on oppression, on work as a space where people can experience both dignity as well as the denial of dignity. Um, so I think, I think that it has had a positive impact. In terms of the future of work, I mean, one of the a PWT uh, kind of informed concern is is the impact of artificial intelligence going to be equitable in the work in the workplace? I think most of us realize it's not going to be equitable. It's going to probably have a much more adverse impact on people who don't have as much choice or volition. And we, we're, we, I think we've we've already seen that as robotics and AI has been has has you know is being rolled out. It's been rolled out for the last few decades. You know, we're just seeing kind of like a rapid increase in the last year or so. 
So I think the future of work um, has the potential to be highly inequitable. And um, I'm not saying that the PWT perspective has changed our vision. I think it's part of a movement uh, in all fields of psychology and organizational studies of trying to critique the status quo and ensure that everybody counts. I think that many of the people who might be listening to this are likely going to be individuals who work in practice as opposed to necessarily people who work in theory or in research. And so, um, and so again, thinking about uh, your integrative framework of basically societal or public policy implications, organizational implications, and individual implications. Maybe we can just take those three buckets and say, are there any places that you've seen that are just really doing it well? Like if we were to look for positive deviance, even within a public policy perspective, mm-hmm. where where should we look? Oh, okay, that's a great question. I would say one of the places where things are going better is the revitalization of unions. I think this is a, a really great example Um, We're seeing a lot more union activity. We did have two strikes recently, the UAW strike and uh, the strikes of of writers, of screen and TV writers and actors. I think these are two really important initiatives. Uh, Unlike strikes in the past, there wasn't that much vilification of workers. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more empathy and sympathy for working people. I think that's a place where we're seeing some progress. Hmm. the, the battle's not over, but there's an increasing recognition that working people need some protections. Mm-hmm. So I do see some positive changes there. I also um, have seen positive changes um, in organizational psychology. I usually go to APA conferences and counseling psychology meetings. I did have a chance to go to the Society for Industrial Organizational Psychology conference uh, this past spring it was here in Boston, and I was part of a panel on critical work psychology, and mm-hmm. it was amazing. There were about 300 people there uh, for a conference that I think didn't even uh, maybe had a thousand people, not many more. So it was a very large turnout and a lot of interest in kind of critiquing the discourse within I- IO psychology. So I th- and that's a practitioner oriented organization. So I do think there's some positive movements taking place. If you were an organizational leader, you were talking to an organizational leader who just really wanted to try to increase the conditions um, where people might experience more decent work, where people might be able to find more meaning in their work, where should they start? Um, One place I think they could start is in trying to maybe bring in some consultants who could help them think about how to establish um, a dignity at work um, initiative. Hmm. What does that mean? So that means trying to ensure that people are treated well, hmm. trying to do trainings, develop policies and norms where people aren't, you know, um, the victims of abuse or, you know, belligerent supervision. I think you can make a lot of changes in an organization by changing the relational structure of it and trying to create norms of decency and dignity. So I think that the, the um, working in the dignity space could make a big difference. Tell us a little bit about the difference between dignity and decency. Just as a b- historical footnote, um, mm-hmm. I read in writing this this article a history of the decent work agenda uh, in a book by Brill. The main thesis, the main point of the history is that there was a push to establish dignified work as the baseline. But the decent work proponents won out. The, there was a view that dignified work was seen as a, too much of a radical agenda, and it would require too much restructuring by organizations. So it's a the difference between dignity and decency is decency is more of a baseline, and dignity might be considered a higher order set of values and norms where people's people are recognized, people are treated with value, people's sense of worth is affirmed. People are treated like human beings and not like cogs in a machine. Um, my uh, my my last question is actually a question to researchers in terms of your feeling of where the field needs to go, and specifically how you can bring more of a more morality focus, more of a values based focus into the way in which organizational research gets done. What what would you what would you like to see? What would you advise for the future? 
within organizational research, I actually see in the European sector of work psychology much more of a focus on social justice and racial justice issues. I think that organizational, and I know there's a lot of diversity of organizational consultants here and organizational practitioners, and I do not mean to any way besmirch um, the great work that they're doing. I guess my my main thought is to try to think about the broader implications of what you're being asked to do by the organization. Hmm. Um, if the organization's bringing you in to, to develop policies that will improve and enhance productivity, um, but do that, it, you have to do it in a way that also makes sure that it that honors people's decency and their dignity. So I've, I've read some pieces where um, people like in call centers, like if they have a really good week of selling something, that becomes the new standard of which they must reach each week. Um, one of my graduate students wrote an essay on her first job at a bookstore. She couldn't wait to work in a bookstore. I've always wanted to work in a bookstore. I had no idea that would the, they were evaluated on how many um, um, membership cards they sold. And um, if a person, like there's one person who didn't sell any in three weeks, she was fired. Awesome. So these things that go behind the scenes that we're not aware of. Mm -hmm. She didn't disclose mm -hmm. it at the bookstore, but... I mean that's that's not the the vibe you get of a bookstore. <laughs> so I think things like that, you know, when people come up with ideas like that of, you know, use the la highest level that a person sold as the baseline, things like that are really not ideal. I also would say um, that we need to d d work on this this issue of precarity in the workplace, of instability. Um, people being fired very quickly i'm sure you've heard stories of this as well mm -hmm. being hired they make a spelling mistake and they're gone I, i've heard stories like that bringing in much much more of that sense of safety and security and being right. able to recognize the the tremendous the tremendous importance that work ultimately plays in terms yes. of our sense of 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 um, himself and in terms of our actual fundamental capabilities in the world if people want to learn more about the psychology of working, where should they go? There's a book called The Psychology of Working that came out in 2006. It's still available. Uh, publisher made a commitment to me that they would never stop selling this book, and it still does well. Um, there's another book called The Importance of Work in an Age of Uncertainty that I wrote in 2019, and that talks about psychology of working and uses the psychology of working framework. And then this article, Understanding Decent Work and Meaningful Work, which again is open access, uh, includes a very detailed description of psychology of working theory. David, thank you so much for your time and, uh, and for helping us understand the psychology of working today. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for inviting me. I really enjoyed our conversation. This was really fun. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Meaningful Work Matters. If you haven't already done so, be sure to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform. And if this episode resonated with you, please take a moment to leave us a review. Your feedback helps us make this podcast better and reach more listeners. You can connect with me, Andrew Soren, on LinkedIn or visit www.eubd.ca to learn more about eudaimonic by design. Finally, if what you heard today spoke to you, tell your colleagues and people in your community about our podcast. We really appreciate your support in making meaningful work matter. See you next time.